The third and most recent vehicle in Peugeot's rather schizophrenic efforts to compete in international sports car racing, the 9X8 builds on the history, if not directly the engineering, of the Group C905 and the LMP1 908. Despite an inconsistent history with top-class prototype racing since their first efforts in the 1990s, those efforts have been inarguably successful. The 905 managed two outright victories and three podiums at Le Mans across its three years of competition, with 1993 a complete podium lockout by the French manufacturer. Their diesel V12 and V8-powered 908s were also the only vehicles to effectively challenge Audi at the height of their dominance, with their 1-2 finish at the 2009 race, the first time in 10 years that an Audi or Audi-derived vehicle had failed to top the podium. Of course, Audi would come back the following year with a heavily reworked version of the R15 TDI win and set a Le Mans race distance record that stands to this day, but still. With the unveiling and subsequent revisions of the hypercar regulations, Peugeot announced their intent to return to the World Endurance Championship for the 2022 season with a new Lego set, a race car. While unfortunately, the current rule set didn't allow Peugeot to just dust off their old diesel hybrid 908, give it some new bodywork and a coat of paint, and call it a day, the new 9X8 does leverage some of the more flexible aspects of the hypercar regulations to depart from current design conventions, foregoing the enormous stabilizing fin and rear wing combo that typifies modern prototype design, instead choosing to hit the target 4 to 1 drag ratio through a combination of complex underbody and rear diffuser engineering with additional winglets placed strategically around the bodywork. The results are, there can be no other word for it, striking, and in the opinion of this commentator, quite compelling. Underneath the unconventional bodywork lies a carbon fiber chassis, designed and built in-house by Peugeot, Housing a similarly homegrown 2.6-liter twin-turbo V6, unsurprisingly mounted behind the driver, which provides its rule-limited 671 horsepower to the rear wheels, while the front wheels receive up to 268 horsepower from the onboard hybrid system, which was developed in conjunction with Total Energies and its SAFT division, and also uses a 900-volt high-density power storage system with Duracell scratched off and Peugeot written on each little battery in green crayon. Ferrari, I am reliably informed, used red crayon to label theirs, as is apropos. A potentially in-house built 7-speed sequential manual gearbox transfers power from the engine to the rear wheels, as always wearing Michelin tires, and while ordinarily this would be where I tell you that the suspension is the typical independent double wishbones with push rods layout for all four wheels, it's time for a... Honestly, this was a comparatively difficult bit to track down information for, and the technical analysis went a bit above my head. Uh, I've cited the full explanation for those of you interested, but I will try to briefly summarize Peugeot's approach. The basic function of a vehicle suspension is to provide a smoother ride while keeping the wheels in effective contact with the road surface. Aggressive driving or uneven road surfaces introduce forces, typically asymmetrically, that work against this objective, causing pressures on the tires and vehicle's body that try to push it in directions that are not the intended direction of travel, generally referred to as roll, pitch, and heave, or yaw, depending on the axes in which the undesirable motion occurs. When this does occur, the vehicle can experience a diminished or total loss of contact with the road surface on one or more corners, leading to a loss of control, which I am informed is generally considered not great, Bob. In the current hypercar regulations, active suspension components such as fore and aft interconnection or the use of inerters are forbidden, which has led to most constructors opting for an independent suspension setup for each wheel, including the aforementioned double wishbones and push rods rockers, springs, and corner dampers, and generally an additional interlinked damper, coil spring, and anti-roll bar for each axle. Peugeot, on the other hand, reportedly took a leaf from some old F1 suspension designs and potentially the Porsche 919, and, as best I can tell, essentially interlinked the main rockers and torsion bars for each wheel to work against one roll and one heave damper per axle where the dampers are centrally located and rely on the counterbalancing action of the dampers against the rocker brackets as a sort of hinge to absorb shocks without transferring it across the axle to the other wheel, 
while greatly reducing suspension complexity and weight compared to a conventional setup. In theory, this should still effectively decouple roll and heave from vertical motion, and rather brilliantly, but in practice the effect has been less obviously successful. While originally intended to debut at the 2022 1000 miles of Sebring, delays in the development of the vehicle, along with an extremely rigorous testing campaign prior to homologation, meant that the 9x8's debut was not until much later at the 2022 Six Hours of Monza. The 9x8 was first rolled out in December 21, before undertaking a testing campaign that saw runs completed at circuits across Europe, including at Portimao, Barcelona, Magnicourt, and Aragon accumulating over 15,000 kilometers of test running in a lead up to its first race at Monza. Monza was, by any metric, a tough race for the French team, though their per lap pace, when the cars were running well, was not too far afield of their competition, Peugeot seemed to experience a raft of problems the scale of which brought to mind the Medusa rather than Castaway. Starting with technical issues in qualifying, the two-car effort was plagued by everything from on-track debris causing overheating to gearbox and engine reliability issues, with their technical director at one point describing their challenges as issues with the overall car system. But the first outing is always a learning experience, and both vehicles managed to finish the next race at Fuji, with the number 93 managing a respectable fourth place overall, albeit seven laps behind the winning Toyota. Both cars experienced an oil leak and turbo difficulties mid-race, dropping the number 94 to second to last place while it was repaired and finishing 20th overall, while the 93 experienced the issue later and as such, learning from the number 94's issue were leveraged to speed up repair times. The final round of the season in Bahrain saw a slight BOP weight reduction for the Peugeots, which when coupled with a power reduction for Toyota, allowed them to top the charts in the first two free practice sessions and take second and fourth in qualifying. In-race reliability issues continued to plague the team, with gearbox problems manifesting for the number 93 car intermittently throughout the race until it retired just inside the seventh hour of running. While the number 94 car had a relatively drama-free run to finish in fourth overall, six laps afield of the winning Toyota. Over winter, an intensive testing regimen to improve vehicle setup and reliability was undertaken, with circuit tests at Paul Ricard and Aragon, but the 2023 season opener at Sebring was still a challenge. In fairness, this isn't terribly surprising. The reliance of the 9x8 on ground effect aero is ill-suited to the Sebring bumps, which inherently upset a car's balance and interrupt its ability to maintain traction and contact with the ground, which is doubly important when running without a big rear wing for downforce. Both cars experienced further gearbox problems, while additional hybrid issues saw the number 94 complete an insufficient distance to be classified, and the number 93 the last place finisher, 26 laps behind the winning Toyota. Portimao seemed to hold promise for the team, following a shift to hydraulic gearshift actuators after Sebring, with 5th and 7th place finishes in a much more crowded hypercar field. Spa saw improved reliability, but the Peugeots could not find a consistent pace, finishing a rather paltry 13th and 17th overall in the lead-up to Le Mans. Le Mans also saw improvements, including a very fun centenary livery, and work on both reliability and pace finally came good, with the number 94 car leading for portions of the evening and early morning hours before an off at the first chicane on the Molzan Strait dropped it from overall contention, and engine issues in the final hour saw it spend significant time in the pits, leaving only to complete a final lap to be classified as a race finisher. The number 93 remained competitive until the 21st hour, when bodywork and power steering issues dropped it to its final classification of 8th overall. Hopefully the results bode well for the 9x8's competitivity at Monza, when it will have technically completed its first full season, admittedly on a bit of a skewed schedule. Anyway, for this week's call to action not involving the three sacred words of YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. It's now officially summertime, and with the arrival of summer comes the arrival of hurricane season, at least for those of us who live on the eastern seaboard of the United States. Yay! It's also a worthwhile time to give some thought to disaster preparedness, both in the Floridian sense and the actual sense. Some states have sales tax holidays to help slightly lessen the financial burden of procuring items such as generators, power banks, radios, and miscellaneous other supplies for protecting your home and or yourself from weather-related damage. 
Several online resources have more details. Check your local listings and always make sure to have your freezer as full as possible several days before a storm may hit. The additional thermal mass will help things stay frozen for much longer if the power goes out, preventing defrosting and food spoilage. Have a good evening, everyone.